Sitchin, Chronicles, Chronicles. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the show. My name is Eric Key, and I'm the director of the Sitchin Chronicles documentary that is forthcoming. We've been in production for about eight months now, and um, if it hadn't been for a pandemic, we would have been wrapping up uh, next month, but that didn't happen. Tonight, I have a very, very special guest for you, and um, I'll start it off with a question. What does Zachariah Sitchin and Travis Walton and Betty and Barney Hill all have in common? Aliens? Yeah. But they also have Jennifer Stein in common. And we've got her here this evening. She's in Philadelphia. And um, I'll let her tell you a lot about herself. But she's an absolutely wonderful person. We recorded this last night. Uh, I used Zoom for the first time. So uh, my camera look, doesn't look good. Hers looks awesome. But we'll, uh, we'll see how it works out. So without further ado, I think we're going to go ahead and just, uh, just jump right into it. So here we go. All right, Jennifer, are you here? I'm here. Thanks for having me, Aaron. I'm very excited to be able to um, uh, share some of your experiences with Zachariah Sitchin. And uh, I know that you have, you know, you spent, probably the last decade of, of his life or even longer, um, you know, being almost his right hand or at least one of his right hands. And well, uh, only had, one, only one of many he had. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so let's, let's just get started. Um, and we're going to start at the very beginning. Um, tell me how you first um, encountered Sitchin's works. Well, I was studying the work of um, this guy named Drumvalo Melchizedek, who wrote the Flower of Life books, and I went to a lecture by Drumvalo, and he was the one who started to speak about the work of Zachariah Sitchin. And I kept coming across it in my notes, going, who's this guy? Who's Zachariah? Who's, who's, who's Zachariah Sitchin? So a group of girlfriends and I uh, were Googling him and, and looking up information. We realized he was having a um, first ever Sitchin seminar in Santa Fe, like in two weeks. And we all just booked airline tickets, booked a hotel, and a group of us flew out together to see him because we were just fascinated by his work. And that's when I started to pick up his books and read. And I think that was in 2000. So I came to Sitchin fairly late. Like a lot of people found him in the 70s, but I didn't. But, um, you know, I had been doing lots of other work and research, but by the time I came to Sitchin's material and I started to read it, you know, I, it suddenly made so much sense to me because of all the other journeys and personal research I had been on. And some of the major concepts in his books just um, really jumped out to me as very, very profound. I mean, just, you know, the famous cylinder seal that he holds up, there's some famous pictures of him holding it up. Right. It was called like that 287 or something in the Pergamon Museum or 284. And just when you look at the solar system on there, you realize that, that what Zach really taught everyone is that ancient cultures, some ancient cultures, especially the Sumerians, knew that we were a heliocentric solar system, that the, the sun was the center of our solar system. And for Hundreds of years after that, even still up into the point of, of uh, Coper uh, Copernicus, there were debates about whether or not, you know, the sun revolved around the earth or the earth revolved around the sun. But the Sumerians knew that thousands of years before and actually not only wrote about it in their cuneiform tablets, you know, they wrote t tons of history about records of eclipses and, and asteroids and comets coming through, um, you know, so... I was just shocked that no one had brought that to the surface before. Like when you read Von Donnegan, right, Chariots of the Gods, he asked a lot of questions and proposed a lot of interesting theories, but he never really dug into the specifics. And what Sitchin did is he gave you meat. If you were a researcher and you had a curious mind, you could get into Sitchin's material and go, oh, wow, you know, there's actual data there. There's actual right, yeah. records. 
So I lived close to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And I started going down to the University of Pennsylvania and going into their, their archives. I became a member so I could get into some of their archives. And I started pulling out the books that are, um, you know, picture plate books that this guy named Woolley did. He was one of mm -hmm. the early archaeologists who went there, with that, like the University of Pennsylvania, the British Museum, and the Pergamon, all sponsored archaeological digs. In, That's in, right. In Sumer yeah. and Ur. And this was in the early 30s, 31, 32, 33, 34, you know, sort of before the advent or, you know, the, the big buildup of the Second World War when a lot of that stopped. But I could go down and look at these plate books and look at pictures of these cylinder seals. And I could also read some of the University of Pennsylvania's Sumerian translations because they had done many translations of a lot of the cylinder seals. And when you read those translations, they weren't that far off from what Zach was saying. And few right. people, I think, really realize that. They kind of referred to it as more a mythological approach to history, but they did basically say some of the same things that Zach is saying. Mm -hmm. So that really garnered a huge amount of respect in, in my book. So I signed up to go to all of the rest of the Sitchin teaching seminars that Zach did over the next 10 years. He was sort of at the point in 2000 where he was ending some of his traveling. He, he kind of traveled from like, I think 1995, maybe up until about 2003 or 2004. He made some group trips, but I didn't know about the group trips. I didn't learn about them. Um, I wasn't on that, the inner circle, so to say, at that, at that period of time. Eventually I worked my way into what, what is considered to be, or he used to call the inner circle. But um, I went to all the teaching seminars he had. He had, like, I think one in Denver. He had some in Los Angeles, some in Chicago, some in Florida, some in Manhattan. Um, and he had uh, one uh, or two in Philadelphia. And um, I, I attended the first one in Philadelphia, and then I helped to coordinate the second one in Philadelphia as well. And I also was so impressed with his work that I managed to get the uh, Free Library of Philadelphia to invite him to come and speak as one of their guest speakers. They do these speaker seminar series. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he did come down to speak there, he um, also decided to do a Sitchin seminar in Philadelphia. So I helped him coordinate that. And that's kind of at the point where I came, came into being more one of his uh, assistants, somebody he would call on to help him organize things, to do flyers for him, to do photographs, to shoot for him, to do research for him. So I'd get these phone messages he, he, Zach was big on faxing. He, he, he really used to like to fax. It was like, you know. So it was high I tech. come home and I had a fax machine in our office downstairs um, and it, it never would catch the paper. The feed didn't work. So when the faxes would come through, they just fly all over the floor in the <laughs> office. So when I would come home and find all these messages from Zach, I'd always be so excited. It was a, a fond memory. I would come home and pick them up and go, oh, look. You know, he texted me. So I'd uh, write little notes and I'd fax them back. So we had a fax relationship because Zach wow. didn't really have a, a cell phone. He, he would call me, but mm -hmm. um, mostly uh, he would communicate with me via fax. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's just funny. And I know we don't think about things like that now because, I mean, we do know that he was Googling before the end. Oh, and, yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, his but, grandson, um, what is his grandson's name again now? I mean, Ariel Feldman. Ariel, Ariel gave him uh, a Mac laptop. So he did have a laptop towards, I would say maybe the last four or five years of his life, but he would hide it. He didn't want anyone to know because he never <laughs> wanted to have the obligation of doing email. He wanted his own private time yeah. to really be able to use that laptop and go out and research things. And, um, you know, I really think he did quite a bit of that. Uh, certainly, it, it helped him in the writing of one of his last two books that he wrote. Um, but yeah, he would he would hide it. He wouldn't let people know, and he That's would never stupid. agree to email with you because he didn't he didn't want to have to learn anything new. All he really knew how to do was research that way. Well, it was a waste of time, I'm sure. He, you know, to have to, you know, go through that learning curve and, you know, 
uh, reinvent the wheel. Uh, it was obviously working well for him. So right. <laughs> right. But whenever anyone came into his apartment, you know, he would fold it up and put it away and pull out the typewriter. Right? He wanted that old, you know, classic typewriter on his desk. But remember, I told you, I do have, I do have some. One photo, right? I have video. Oh, you have video of, of him. him sitting there at his computer. And um, yeah, it's, it's a rare one too. So uh, yeah. we're going to, we're going to make some good use of that one for the people who uh, didn't know that he, uh, you know, never saw him get to use that computer. I want to go back now um, because we're going to go back and talk about you a little bit. Then we're going to come okay. back and, and, and talk about Zach. So you are the director of uh, one of the chapters of MUFON, correct? Yes, I am a, actually a state section director, but I don't actually do field investigation work like a lot of field investigators do. I do um, public outreach, education, community organization, um, conference coordinating. What you probably don't know about me, Eric, is I was a party planner before I... I thought you were going to say a party animal. <laughs> no, no I, was a, I was a party planner. You know, after I got married, I joined a bunch of um, nonprofit organizations and I started to do some philanthropy work because it was the first time I really didn't have to work for a living mm. and I, I could give back a little bit. So in the days when I did a lot of um, community organizing and nonprofit work, I would eventually have to create events because all nonprofits have to raise money. So I would hold auctions or we would have, you know, um, you know, entertainment night or party nights or film nights or things like that. And I would coordinate these and put them together. So it was natural that uh, eventually a friend approached me and said, let's start a party planning business together. And we would do weddings, bar and bat mitzvahs, 40th, 50th, 60th birthday parties. So we would do soup to nuts. You know, we would counsel people on how to use a caterer and, you know, we would order tablecloths and set up backdrops and do lighting and hire entertainment. And so it was natural for me to get into conference coordinating. And when I found Sitchin's work and things like that, I decided I wanted to kind of retire as a party planner because I just couldn't get excited about the next bar mitzvah or wedding. And I knew <laughs> I was done because it's a huge amount of work. I mean, right. huge. you have to coordinate with a whole lot of people and timing is everything. If you don't have things like right on the nickel when that bride's walking down the aisle, you know, forget it, your reputation is destroyed. And I had to work sometimes with very difficult union people in Philadelphia. You know, I had stuff stolen off the, lawn, the landing docks all the time. And, you know, people don't show up for a job you're trying to set up. And it was racing, racing, racing. It was very high stress. Yeah. And I just said, okay, I'm done. You know, I've proved I can do this and I'd like to do other things. So I took those skills and I brought them to MUFON. And I decided I would do public outreach and education. And literally, I was asked to do that by the then state director because I was already doing things for the noetic sciences. I had gotten involved in uh, noetic sciences like 35 years ago. I, I would, had the great gift of meeting Edgar Mitchell when I was about 19 years old. We oh, became wow. pen pals, writing connection people. And when he started noetic sciences, I started buying the magazine, starting started to go to conferences and I was doing outreach and educational programs on a sort of slightly off topic, uh, you know, or out of the box concepts like ESP or life after death, or, you know, is there life out there in the universe and uh, what is consciousness? So I was already doing programs in this genre at my right. public library, bringing in speakers, showing films and whatnot for uh, noetic sciences. And then when MUFON stepped up and asked me if I would also do programs on UFOs, I said, oh, absolutely. It's like, like the next great step. And then shortly thereafter, I founded Mainline MUFON, which uh, I live on the main line outside of Philadelphia. It's a very conservative area. So the words main line and then MUFON, it's kind of like an oxymoron. Like, how can you be that conservative and really be interested in UFOs? You know, so people who live in Philadelphia kind of get it. It's kind of like an inside joke in the name. But um, that's been going on for almost 20 years. I'm wow. aging myself. I started that when I was like 45 and I just turned 65. So wow, it's been quite a journey. And of course, the Sitchin work fell right into that. But uh, and then I've also been doing film work for, for almost mm -hmm. 20 years now, too. So I, right. I started filming in the event business. 
I would film my jobs to sell the next job. And then I just started doing videos for my daughter's school. And I guess I'm an artist. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm an entrepreneur like. and an artist and uh, what they call one of those cultural creatives. So yeah. uh, like you, I work in many, many mediums. Yeah. Yeah. And, Jack of all uh, trades. <laughs> it was a natural. It was a natural. So that's all right. so, when I got into filmmaking. So we're going to take another step back because I want to know when you first got interested in UFO phenomenon, um, you know, because there it, it goes on back, right? So we're chipping yeah. away here. So yeah. there's something that, that led you to. Believe. An expanded awareness for sure. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'd had a number of odd experiences as a child. Um, I had a healing experience and things like that, which probably should not have happened. So I knew that the universe was a little wider. And when I was 19, I had a major UFO experience. Um, it was a, uh, just to share with you briefly, it was a large rectangle of white light that appeared outside my bedroom window in a, a rural area where I lived in the middle of Mennonite farmland. My dad was an architect and he built a modern house in the middle of a hillside. So you entered the house on the upper level on the high side of the hill and then you walked down through the house and there were floor to ceiling glass windows that looked out over a pool area and a meadow and, the, and more farmland. Right. So I was in a- You grew up in a hobbit hole? <laughs> not quite a hobbit home, but you know, <laughs> it, was, it was very much like a Frank Lloyd Wright type of house, you know, because my dad actually had uh, spent some time, worked in a firm that Frank Lloyd Wright had affiliations with. So my dad actually met him in Chicago. I think in the 40s, the early 40s. Wow. Well, long story short, we had a very modern house with floor to ceiling windows. So my bedroom looked out over maybe six or seven acres of farmland and a hill and a valley. And this is where I had this major sighting. But I wasn't alone at the time. There was somebody else in the house at the same time who saw it, but we never talked about it. <laughs> This was kind of like, he wasn't really a boyfriend, but he was, he was a boyfriend. He was a very close friend. We had spent a year together in a, in a musical road show called Up With People. Oh, I, I know that. With people. <laughs> and he had been in Europe for a year and came back to, to, to New York City. He got a charter flight into New York City. I drove up from Philadelphia, picked him up, and he was like completely out of money. And he needed to earn some money before he could get transportation back to Florida. So he was staying with myself and my, fam my, you know, my parents. Mm -hmm. And he had the same sighting I had. But Eric, we never talked about it at the time. It was literally around 2000 when I started to step more into the UFO field that this, we, we got together in Hawaii and had like a little reunion and a visit. My husband and I had gone there to take our, our PADI open water dive tests so we could be PADI certified in scuba diving. And then my husband went off to Japan to work where he was gonna be for a month. And I stayed on for another couple of days to visit my friend, John Trevitt who traveled and up with people with me. And while I was visiting John, he said to me, what happened when we had that UFO experience? Yeah. And I, I like, whoa, I said, what? You know, I don't remember you having the same experience I had. And through talking, we realized that it was a real <laughs> event. And that's when I gave myself permission to say, okay, you know, I'm in, I wanna to go to UFO conferences. I'm gonna start reading books. I'm gonna start studying this, this topic. And, you know, I went to some of the classics first, you know, I went to read Edward Ruppelt and Donald Kehoe and things like that. That got me into going to conferences. And before you know it, MUFON approached me and said, would you do these public education programs? Yeah, you seem to be, you know, quite good at many, of you have a lot of good professional skills. We'd love to, to do this. And I said, Sure, as long as you don't want me, you know, running around the countryside taking UFO reports. Right now, I don't feel I have the time to do that. And as a single woman, I didn't necessarily want to be doing that. Also, as a filmmaker, I thought there might be a bit of a conflict of interest there. Yeah. So I said, um, I'll do the public education and outreach, and that they were grateful. And that started in, you know, early 2002. And I've been going ever since. Well, I, and I'm going to kind of interject here because, you know, I didn't know this whole story. I knew that you had had an encounter, but what you've just said, um, 
I have a, 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 a mirrored experience and, I, and I'm going to tell you because this is really strange. I have chills right now. Um, so in right after high school in 1983, I loaded my drums in the back of this car of this traveling evangelist. And we traveled all over South Alabama, um, Georgia and the panhandle of Florida. And he was, uh, he, he put on revivals and he played piano and I played and sang and I played drums. So we were always on the road. We were staying with, you know, just people who there at the church, whatever. There happened to be a, another fellow with us at one point and we were driving, we were near the Okefenokee swamp down, but it, but it was, um, that's more, uh, Savannah area, but it, it was, it was, it was more, it was near, uh, Apalachicola, Florida. And, um, you know, if you've ever been in that area, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of moss from the trees and there's just miles and miles of open land and something happened and we didn't talk about it a lot because nobody could really, we didn't really know what to talk about. And, um, every once in a while and over the years I would talk to him, he goes, Hey, you remember when we saw that UFO? And it's like, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know what we saw, you know? <laughs> and um, so about three years ago, I received a call from the other guy who was with us. And he said, what did we see that night? And I said, I don't, I don't know. I said, I have gone over this, you know, it's, it's, it's in my head, but I, I've become obsessed with this, you know, and it, it, it's almost like um, Richard Dreyfus and, you know, in, in, in close encounters, I don't know if that's a thing or not, but, but did we just have you and I just kind of have a little experience where, you know, in our, in our lives where it, it came back slowly, but we were compelled to learn everything we could about it because I, you know, I mean, I like you, I'm, I mean, I don't know if you call yourself obsessed, but it's always in the forefront of my mind. You know, if I talk to some weird person, I'm like, that's an alien. No, I don't. I'm not. <laughs> It's not quite that bad. Yes, Eric, I, I would agree with you. I think the idea of whether or not we are alone or not is one of the biggest existential questions facing humanity today. Yeah. And the problem is we know enough now about other potential life, you know, uh, in, inhabiting planets that are out there yeah. just from what we can observe that the likelihood is far greater that there are is life out there yeah so then the big question is okay has that life traveled here and interacted with us and when you start to look at people like sitchin you know it's yes. obvious yes they have been here and they have been here in the ancient past and they've been here in the in the recent past and they'll probably be here in the future and well as you know my, myself i you know growing up because i was always searching for something and at that time I was, you know, I mean, my dad thought it was the greatest thing in the world that I'm traveling with an evangelist, but, uh, you know, I don't think it did me any good except for the, <laughs> made me stop going to church. But anyway, um, I, 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 I don't know. I'm just, I, I've just, I was, I, I was really into the Bible. I was going to go to Bob Jones university. I was going to go to seminary school. I figured that I was going to be a preacher. And, you know, just, just things that happened to me, you know, discovering Von Donneken and then uh, Sitchin, because I was, you know, I was really into Sitchin and everything at, at that time. So I, I, I don't know, but, but, but the knowledge I know of the Bible, which never made, you know, it is like, okay, this is a good story, but it doesn't connect. There's this, it's like, uh, I got a book and there's, you know, the middle parts taken out. And then to be able to, to read, you know, the translations, uh, you know, from the cuneiform tablets and, um, and those, a lot of those Sumerian, um, you know, uh, myths, legends, whatever, it made a lot of sense. You know, Noah, I mean, I love the story that, that Sitchin tells uh, about, you know, the, the real Noah, the real story that happened, what, 2,500 years before the biblical version. And, you know, and, it, and we know why, um, we know that Enlil didn't, they were making too much noise. And we know that, that, you know, Inky was there to save them. And, and, you know, in, in the Hebrew that it's, 
Is that a phone? No, I'm the, just making sure it stops. Oh, that's all right. In the in the Hebrew, um, you know, we 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 um, we 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 get we know that care that we know the character of Noah and being able to to go back and and find the original, you know, because it was first translated as God's and then it was changed to God, you know, so that they could you know make it this uh, you know monotheistic um, entity there. So I, I don't know. I'm I, anybody, and you know, you find I, I've run across a whole lot of people who are very religious people who kind of attached to um, uh, Sitchin and, you know, like Jason Martell from Ancient Aliens. He's one. You know, we've talked about that. The, Sitchin just made so much sense to him. And he was raised in a, in a Christian home. And he, you know, he was, you know, good Christian guy. And, but, but once you read it, you know, you can't unring that bell. That reverberation is always in, in your head. And, you know, if I say, okay, I'm going to put this out of my head, which I've done many times because like, I don't want to hear it anymore. I don't want to hear the noise of, of, of Sitchinism pop up in my head all the time, but it just makes too much sense. You know, you agree, right? Yes. Yes, I do. But Eric, it does take a integration process. It takes uh, a lot to really fully digest the idea that maybe our, understanding of biblical history and miracles and early civilization that was here had something to do with an extraterrestrial species or race that may have come here and brought with them their own philosophies and their own you know religious traditions or their own way of organizing society and that's really what, what Zach brought into his writing. That's right. The yeah. whole idea that, that the Anunnaki or the Sumerians brought with them uh, a code of law and a, a code of ethics, which they recorded in their Sumerian tablets and seals. And when you look at that, when you read what some of those are, Zach always believed or thought that it, it reflected Jewish values. And he felt that the root of Judaism kind of came through this Anunnaki line. He used to often say that um, the whole idea that possibly, he thought that they came from, from Nibiru, from a home planet. So he thought the concept and wording of even Hebrew came from the whole idea of Nibiru, when you look at those two words together. So he did an awful lot of language study. Mm -hmm. Talk about Eden, what Eden was. It was, you know, it was the where, where Ea founded civilization, you know? So Ea and Eden, when you start to look at the way these names of things come together. And then Zach did this whole investigation into DNA and how DNA had these certain strands or codes of sequencing. And, and they were usually three and th three sequenced codes. And he said that was the beginning and the basis of language. You know, when you got into reading how he linked these fundamental concepts together, I was absolutely blown away because I had studied Kabbalah and the whole understanding of conceptual ideas and understanding of the building blocks of nature and how that relates to language. Mm -hmm. This reflected exactly that in, in Zach's writings. And I was really, you know, stunned again. I like every time I read one of Zach's books, I would be like literally stunned and you'd walk around for days thinking about these things, you know, like even the whole concept of, of the ca base counting of 60, right? Mm -hmm. Of 60 minutes in an hour and how it had to do with, you know, the rotation of the sun around the earth and the number of hours in a day and that, you know, places like Stonehenge and things like this were early clocks and, mm -hmm. you know, it, when you would read and digest his material, it began to finally sink in on a deeper level that, you know, our whole concept of, of gods could have come from an alien species. But that's not an easy step to make, especially if you've come from a fundamentalist religious tradition, yeah. which everything is black and white, you know, or it's, it's heaven or hell, it's, it's damnation if you accept certain ideas and 
and you know jubilation if you uh, you know agree on blind faith that you know uh, Jesus is your savior and he's going to take care of everything. I mean, I don't I don't put down anyone's religious traditions, but at least Judaism makes you think about a king or a god of of the universe. It, it's a bigger concept. And it's not something so limited to some of the more traditional, you know, Christian ideas now, today. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's so ironic because Christianity grew completely out of Judaism, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Jesus was a Jew. Jesus didn't yeah. know about Christianity. It was invented after he was gone, you know. Well, the Apostle life. Paul was an amazing marketer, so. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, he was. Really, it's really hard to get to the point that maybe you and I are at now. And it, mm -hmm. takes, it takes somebody 20, 25 years of yeah. reading and studying. And that's actually, Eric, that's why I committed to doing these public education programs. Because I felt like if I could do something in my own community, in my own backyard, right, in my local library, go do some programs. You know, I didn't even know I was gonna do it for 20 years. I just thought I'd do it for a year or two. And, yep. you know, it just kept getting better and easier and simpler. And I got better at what I was doing. And it just, it just kept going. But I knew that in order to help people shift their minds, open their minds and think on a broader scale, they, it was going to take years. This is not something somebody can do reading one or two books. I know. You know? Yeah. Because way too much fear comes up, way too many questions come up. And uh, it's what we think is it really affects the reality that we live in. And if you, and I've just found this more and more and more in my life, that if you truly have an open mind for potential and potentialities to come into your life, then they can. But if your mind and your ideas are closed, you know, you might as well be trying to penetrate wood. You know, you're I not going to get through it. You know, uh, Tell me about like your friends, family, when you start talking this, I'm going to say crazy stuff. Let's talk yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, like I said, I grew up on the main line, right? My girls went to a private, you know, school and I was involved in the school. I did all sorts of things, fundraising and, you know, event coordinating and things like that. And I can remember some of uh, the events where, like, I got interviewed on a couple of local television shows periodically, and people would come up to me at, like, the parent cocktail parties, and they would say, you know, I saw you. I saw you. And I'm like, oh. And then, like, that's all they ever said to me, ever again. Like, they never spoke to me again. Like, no, no open criticism, but they just couldn't digest it. So, yeah, and even my husband. She's a witch. <laughs> yeah, my husband, my kids, even my extended family. Oh, no, you right. froze up. There you go. I'm sorry, you froze okay. up for a second. Yeah, I'll, I'll be at a bar mitzvah or a wedding or something, and there'll be chit-chat at the bar where people are laughing about, oh, yeah, there's Jen, you know, she's into the UFO things. But then I'll be outside later at the courtyard or I'll be in the bathroom and somebody comes up to me and they go, I have to talk to you. I have to talk to you. And they have to tell me their experiences, right? Yeah. I can't tell you how many people, presidents of synagogues, attorneys, you know, principals of schools have come and said, can you come and sit with me? I need to tell you my story. And somehow they feel like by telling me I'm witness to their experience. And then they feel better after they've told me. But because started, you're open-minded. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But they don't know how to digest it. And they just feel like they have to share it with me, but they can't let anybody else know. And of course I'm sworn to secrecy. And I always say to them, look, I, I gain nothing from sharing your story, but I'm grateful that you had the courage to share it. And I said, I think this is my role and part of my duty. And I, you know, I just, I thank them and I encourage them to be open-minded because they might see something again. And it might be an opportunity to actually have some give and take. Mm -hmm. There are some people like the amazing Susie Hansen in Australia. She actually has been having contact all of her life and, and uh, a number of people have. Even um, Kathleen Martin has recently come out and talked about the open contact she has had back and forth. So I think, I, I think that um, there may be species that are really trying to help us. 
and help yeah. our planet. And they have to do it through us. Through They're people. called liberals. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe, you know, but um, there are people having contact. There's these CE5 groups that are meeting, stimulated by, you know, um, Greer, um, Stephen yes. Greer. So, you know, there's more things in this the universe, like they say in Shakespeare, you know, there's more to this world, Horatio, than is in your and my imaginations. That's right. That's right. And that, you know, that's the big thing that I deal with all the time, especially, you know, I, I read these books over and over and over again, Sitchin's books. And, you know, what, what just confounds me is like, what if, and we always have to preface it with what if, but what if there are, you know, what, what if some of those early uh, translations, the Sumerian translations were just, uh, you know, I can't find a word for this. So I'm going to, I'm going to label it with something else. I'm going to get words that we do not understand words that did not come to us, you know, that were tr because, you know, anytime we don't understand something, we try to make up something for it and a story, which is mythology. And it, to me, I feel like that, that Sitchin was, he was all over it, but I feel like there were, because, you know, there's a lot of things that, that people find that, you know, where they say, well, he contradicts himself or he does this, or, you know, th this was wrong. And he talks about, you know, in translations, it's more than just looking at the literal translations of things. It's also um, the, the, the person who is translating their interpretation of that. And so, so my guess is that there is still, uh, an enormous amount, amount of lost information out there. You know, maybe one of these days, you know, some ziggurat will be discovered with another 50 gazillion tablets. If people would, if the, you know, Al Qaeda, or whoever would stop bashing destroying. everything in, You're just leave the stuff. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And you know, it makes me wonder why. Why did they do, is it for spite? Do they know, oh, people like these antiquities, so let's take a sledgehammer and, or, you know, it's just like when, when we went into Baghdad and they immediately, you know, you know, supposedly, and I don't know this firsthand, but, you know, there were the guys in there with the, you know, sort of coordinating what was being taken out of the antiqui antiquities room. So I, I, I feel like that they're, you know, I personally believe that the Vatican has so much information. I know that Sitchin, you know, when when he would talk to um, Monsignor Baldelucci, I know that that they talked about things. And were you were you in that room when that happened? No, but I have a good friend who videotaped it. <laughs> Yeah, with a so, camera just sitting on the table there. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah, and we're gonna we gotta snag that. <laughs> Allison, Allison and Bob Scheimer were sitting across from Balducci and Sitchin while they were talking, and they just yeah. turned their camera on. Yeah, well, and you know those guys are going. He's like, "No, you can't tell anybody." And he's like, "I won't tell anybody, but if I live to be ninety-five, I'm gonna write a book over." It. You know, I just you know you know those things happen, and then you know, Balducci died, Sitchin died. Yes. And, and, uh, and, and, and Richard Harrington died. Right. <laughs> so. Yes. And Harrington died in very unusual circumstances, yeah. you know, just after Sitchin had gone to see him. I know. That had gone to see him and confirmed. Uh, what, what Harrington did is he went down to the Southern Hemisphere and confirmed that there was some massive object that you could only see in infrared. You couldn't see it in normal light. That's right. And, and, and I, from what I understand, Harrington actually reported that to NASA and to our uh, our U.S. government because he was in charge of like some kind of national observatory. Yes, so he was the U.S. Naval Observatory. He yeah. was the the director, I believe, of it. Right, or senior so scientist, was, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, to him, this was huge, huge mm -hmm. news, and he wanted to get it out right away because it could be, you know, a life extinguishing or or you know serious issue that we were going to need to deal with on the planet. Yeah. And within like just a couple of days of Sitchin going to see him and discussing it, he dies of, of cancer in five days from the time he was diagnosed to the time he was dead, some kind of esophageal cancer. That's right. That's right. That's that's right. I, I've been trying to contact his wife. Uh, you know, she, his wife, by the way, this would be my segment, segment called uh, 
something completely unrelated, but his wife was a Olympic medal winner. I didn't know that. I can't remember what she did though. She was, I don't know. She was, uh, did she ski or skate? You're the skier, right? I am. I'm the skier who <laughs> fractured her shoulder skiing this year. I, I I'm having to connect the everything. Of March. So I've been self quarantining since the first of March. Maybe it's for my benefit. Was that Utah? Were you in yeah, Utah? I was in yeah. Utah. Yeah, in Deer Valley. All right. So, so your journey led you to uh, direct, I guess, create basically the entire thing, edit everything else, uh, a documentary on one of the most famous abduction cases in U.S. history, maybe world history. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's talk about Travis. Travis. Yeah, which is also behind me. People can see it, but you know, I don't know it's if it's beautiful. in reverse or not. I see all your Oscars. Oh, those are those. Yeah, are EBE. those are these are the the um, EBE awards. These are fun. Yeah, yeah this is like uh, it's classic. It's a little alien who's standing and he's holding a uh, a camera reel, like you know, under his uh, arm, and over here he's holding a video camera. I love it. So it's kind of like an Oscar. It's their version of an Oscar. And then they put on the bottom what it is. So, um, yeah, I've actually, I've had the pleasure, the year we showed Travis at uh, the uh, International UFO Congress, I uh, took both of their awards, both uh, Best Documentary and People's Choice Award. And then a couple of years before, I had won those two awards as well for something called the Disclosure Dialogues that I did with Ron James. And this mm -hmm. is the... This is a fascinating thing with all sorts of experts, you know, Nick Pope and uh, even Edgar Mitchell when he was still living. Uh, we, we interviewed a number of experts and uh, actually what we did is we got experts together to talk to each other because a lot more comes out, you know, as an interviewer, mm -hmm. you may not always know the right questions to ask, but I would, I put together a schedule where people from, with similar backgrounds would get together and talk about what they know. And the famous Richard Dolan and Danny Sheehan are the ones that set this off for me. They, uh, Danny Sheehan came up to me because I know Danny pretty well. And he asked me to introduce him to Richard Dolan so that they could talk about what they know. Danny Sheehan being actually um, former, you know, um, uh, legal counsel for the Vatican. And That's having right. He's a white haired guy, white curly haired guy. He's a white haired guy. guy. Yes, yep. yes, yes. He's done a lot of very interesting political work, but he's also... A, a lawyer. So mm -hmm. he has a very interesting background. And, and he went to um, divinity school, I think, at, at Harvard. So he's, um, he's got both the Jesuit, you know, understanding and background and the theological history, but then he's also an attorney. So he asked me to introduce him to Rich Dolan so the two of them could sit down. And he said, Jen, I want you to film this for me. Now, this was the first uh, International UFO Congress I went to. It was the last one in Lachlan, Nevada. It was in 2009. And I went as a guest. I didn't have any camera equipment with me. And I said, well, Danny, that would be a great thing to do. That's so exciting. I said, let me think on how I can do that. I didn't <laughs> say no, but I had no camera equipment. Everything was in Philadelphia. And mm -hmm. I'm standing there in the lobby of the Atlantic or the Aquarius Hotel thinking, how is this going to happen? I was like, oh, dear God, please help me make this possible. <laughs> and I was just like thinking, well, I could go to a store. I could buy a camera. I could, you know, and I was thinking about all these possibilities. And while I'm running through them in my head, what walks by me? But the camera I own in Philadelphia that I know intimately well, because as a camera person, you just don't pick up a rare camera and suddenly <laughs> know how all the features work, right? The camera I own walks by me at eye level, right in front of me on the shoulders of Ron James, whom I did not know at the time. So I just went, Whoa. I just started following the camera, oh right? Thinking, how am I gonna ask this man if I can borrow his $7,000 camera and maybe his lights and maybe his mics and, you know, could be like well, over $25,000 worth of equipment. He's just not gonna turn it over to me. Like, how is this gonna work? What exactly am I gonna say? And I just finally tapped him on the shoulder and said, excuse me, you know, can we talk? <laughs> can I borrow <laughs> and, your camera? Uh, I ended up, he, he said, yes, he, he shot it with me. And it was so good. He said, well, we got to come up with a project for this. And I said, oh, let's call it. I said, let's call it Dialogues on Disclosure. And then he came up with the whole idea to call it 
disclosure dialogues. He kind of reversed it around. So this was our first thing. This is not that I'm selling this at all. I, it's you can't That's okay. Even, I'll put the link. You can't buy in this as a DVD anymore, but it streams online. We decided not only would we make a documentary, but we would enclose all the interviews in a five disc DVD set. So that's, that was one of my first film projects. Then wow. from there, then from there, I did a bunch of stuff for Sitchin periodically, lectures he did at Columbia and other things mm -hmm. like that. Then I guess, oh, then I did In Their Own Words, which is a uh, Betty and Barney Hill story. I don't yes. know if you can see that. These yeah, are the, these are the tapes, the audio tapes that were transcribed from Betty and Barney Hill. And I worked with Kathleen Martin. She was at my house at the time and she wanted to hone down the tapes to be just Betty and Barney telling their own story through their regression tapes. And because they did many regressions with Dr. Simon, who was a, um, uh, a Harvard trained uh, uh, psychiatrist. And what they eventually, uh, you know, they went for six months and had series of regressions to get the whole story out. Yeah. So they kept repeating things and repeating things and repeating things. So she had like 20 tapes that she had to narrow down into like an hour. So I said, I'll do that. <laughs> I volunteer. I'll step up to the bat. So I took those audio tapes and got it down. I stayed up all night one night and just did it because she was here at my house staying over for a conference. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to kind of get that tight. So once I got the audio tight, then we loaded visuals to it and I shot interviews with her and we did it into a, a, a video. So that was one. And then the next big thing I did was the Travis DVD. And this one is the one that won all these 28 film festival awards. And this is the very famous story. I don't know if you can see it because there might be a glare mm -hmm. on it. This is the very famous story of Travis Walton who was a logger in the Sitgraves National Forest. And he and seven, well, he and six other loggers, seven altogether, encountered a craft in the canopy of the trees as they were leaving the forest one day. And it was very, very clear it was a UFO. None of them mistook it to be Venus or Jupiter or, <laughs> you know, uh, a full moon or something. It's, uh, it was obviously a UFO. And of course, Paramount, took Travis's story and made a film called Fire in the Sky, which was a fictionalized version of Travis's real story. D.B. Sweeney. He was one of that's, my favorite actors in the 80s. That's right. That's right. So uh, he, um, Travis was always kind of frustrated by the fact that Tracy Torme was kind of manipulated by the, 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 you know, the Hollywood machinery, yeah. um, the people at Paramount, his executive producer above him at Paramount said, we've got to take this on board the craft experience that Travis remembers and just make it really scary and horrifying, you know, so we're going to try to take whatever bits of information he's, he's given us and we're going to like exaggerate it. And Travis was very disappointed by that because he thought this was going to be a, a better film about his experience. But at least it, it really captured the difficulty that all these loggers had yeah. with telling the truth and being accused of murder. Uh, that's why this broke as an international story and why it's so famous, because not only is it a UFO story, but as soon as the boys, the logging crew reported Travis missing and he was missing for five days, it broke in the international news as a missing person story, potential homicide story, and a UFO story all lumped together. Well, you know, the news jumped all over that. Plus yeah. every UFO group there was, you know, APRO and uh, MUFON didn't exist yet. But um, I think the Midwest uh, 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 UFO group did. That's what eventually became MUFON. Mm -hmm. And a number of other groups, you know, just glommed onto this story and started calling the family and it was just a mess, you know. So what I decided to do when I met Travis a number of years ago in 2010, I was asked to help coordinate one of the Roswell conferences, you know, because Roswell has these big UFO conferences every year and 10,000 people, you know, come to the city and it's a huge thing to organize. So I got asked to come out and work with my good friend, Peter Robbins, to help organize the, um, the mayor's conference, because not only does the museum in Roswell do a conference, but the city and the mayors coordinate their own conference. So there's multiple events going on. So I was there working uh, under the direction of Peter Robbins and Travis was one of our presenters and speakers. And we went out to dinner 
And after, you know, a bottle of wine, Peter and I said to Travis and some other people who were there, Ruben Udiarte was a good friend of mine from MUFON in Northern California. We said to Travis, why don't you think about organizing a conference in Snowflake or Holbrook or Heber, you know, one of the towns associated with your story, because your story is as certainly as big as Roswell and it's 20 years newer. You know, mm -hmm. it's not, you know, 60 years in the past. It's only like 25 or 30 years in the past. At that point, it was like, like 35 years in the past. And we said, hey, in like the 45th anniversary or the 40th anniversary is coming up, why don't you think about planning a conference? And that's actually how this film began because Travis wanted to have a conference. Peter and I volunteered to kind of be his coach and, and assist with helping him to organize it. And Travis wanted to take people up into the forest. And I said, you know what? That's a little dangerous, you know, at night, you wanna take 50, 60 people way out. You know, you have to hike 45 minutes from the nearest dirt road in over brush and brumble and piles of, and puddles and, you know, stones and stuff you can't even see. In pitch blackness, right? You want to take them to the site? I, I don't think that's really a good idea in terms of, uh, you know, insurance, conference. That's right. That's going to be awfully hard to do. So I said, I know, Travis, let's do a virtual tour. I tried to talk him into this. I, I, I actually ended up failing. He, he ended up taking people to the woods anyway, but at least we took them <laughs> in the day. And yeah. then it got dark while we were there, which was a problem. But long story short, I started to make this film with the idea that it would be something we could show at his conference to the people who showed up to be a virtual tour of the woods. And I asked him to bring in some of the other guys. And once I had that under my belt, and it turned out to be really pretty good footage, then I got involved in being a uh, coordinator for the 2014 MUFON Symposium in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And I had all these great speakers coming in, like, um, you know, uh, Kathy Martin and Stanton Friedman and, uh, um, Lee Spiegel, and uh, we even had um, George Knapp there, and mm -hmm. um, Jan Harzine, and just a number of really great people. James Fox was there, Stephen Bassett was there, Linda Howe was there. So I said, okay, I'll take a studio, I'll make a studio in one of the hotel rooms, we'll set up a backdrop and lights, and we'll interview these speakers when they're not presenting for MUFON. And that's how we ended up getting all these talking heads and having these great, you know, commentary. Uh, we even have Lynn Katai, who we interviewed. So now we're in the process of making like a compendium DVD in honor of the 45th anniversary that we'll probably be releasing with all the other people who didn't make it in to the basic documentary. But so they were all in one place. They were all in Cherry Hill, all speaking at the UFO conference uh, there that year. So it was per it made perfect sense to sit them down and interview them. And, and then, then I ended up going back out to the forest and back out to Arizona. And that's when I started tracking down people like the polygraph expert named Cy Gilson. Mm -hmm. And the head of police was still alive at that point. He has now since passed away. His name was yep. uh, Deputy, um, I'm sorry, it was uh, uh, Sheriff Gillespie, Sheriff Marlon Gillespie. Then I tracked down uh, Deputy Ellison. So I got more and more people who, and, and Travis's brother, I got to interview finally, Don. And um, so we, 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 you know, we had the crew interview, we had these experts, and then we had some of the people involved in the story at the time. And it really turned into more of a human interest story than a UFO story. And that's why I think this film did so well in mainstream film festivals. It was no. very heartfelt. And I, I know when you first gave me a copy of it, I watched it uh, a couple of days later and I was just so at ease, you know, because it wasn't a bunch of technical stuff. It didn't sound, you know, there wasn't crazy stuff going on. <laughs> I keep using that word, right. but yeah. you know, it, it was just, it was just really, 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 um, these were real people. These were not experts on anything. They, these guys were lumberjacks. That's and uh, right. let's, um, if you don't mind, I'd like to roll the trailer for uh, our sure. viewer. Sure, sure, sure. I would love that. Thank you. That would be All right. Great. Here we go. Hi, my name's Jennifer Stein. I've completed a film called Travis, the true story of Travis Walton. 
In this film, you're going to see archived interviews of the logging crew, as well as new and updated interviews we've done. You're going to have a tour of the actual site where the UFO incident took place. We're going to learn about new forensic evidence which has come to light in the last 40 years. And you're going to be able to see the incredible experience that Travis Walton went through and how this has affected his life over the last 40 years. It was a terrifying experience, you know. I imagine uh, the most shook up one was probably Steve. He was only like 17. I think he actually lied about his age to get the job out there. Yeah, I was 17, so I was, I was the kid. I thought we was going to go to jail for murder. There was times I was saying we need to go back. There was times I was saying we need to go get help. You know, I mean, it went back. Everybody was going back and forth, you know, in their own minds and between each other. When we got back there and we looked around the area and we couldn't find Travis, that's when it hit Mike. Mike and Travis were best buddies then, you know, and stuff. And, and I think he felt really bad about taking off and leaving him like that. We came off the mountain after we was looking for Travis and we couldn't find him. And we pulled in there and Kenny got out and called the sheriff's department. I think Kenny just told him it was a missing person. He didn't tell him what was up, you know. It didn't come directly to me, it came to a, a deputy sheriff in Heber who called me on the phone and then he gave me a little more detail on it about you guys coming in from the woods and, and something got your attention. A few minutes after we parked out in front of the station here, Deputy Ellison arrived. Three of us volunteered right away to get in his car with him and tell him what had happened. He says that he didn't believe us or disbelieve us, you know, he was going to be neutral. But before we went up on the hill to radio, for him to radio the sheriff, we better be certain. What the hell happened to this young man? How is it that he could just disappear? We're a rough looking bunch then, you know, and uh, a bunch of us out there with chainsaws and that, and some conflicts here and there, you know. So they, um, they just immediately start assuming, well, they killed this guy, you know, because they weren't gonna believe that wild story we were telling them. The police, and no one can blame them, had to look at the much more obvious real world possibility that these hardworking, tough blue collar guys, even though they were friends, there was a falling out, there was a fight, an argument, and one way or another, um, Travis lost his life. The body was hidden. I hope you're taking interest in this film. If you'd like to learn more about it, visit TravisWaltonTheMovie.com. There's a wonderful conference coming up in Arizona in 2015 on November 5th. And if you'd like to learn more about that, visit SkyFireSummit.com. So if you folks have not seen this, you can click on the link uh, below and uh, you can uh, get a copy of it if you want. And also there'll be several links at the bottom uh, with other uh, DVDs and, and things that, that Jennifer has. Um, so Jennifer, tell us about why do you think it was so successful? Well, I think it was successful because we didn't attempt to prove anything. You know, a lot of UFO films do not make it into, UF, into film festivals, it's certainly mainstream film festivals, because the film itself takes the premise that they are going to like tell everybody, they're going to tell the world what they don't know about UFOs, right? We're going to prove it. We're going to, and they hammer people on the top of their head, like you were saying, with, with facts and details that people really don't know how to digest. And, and absorb. And we didn't do that at all. We made it a human interest story about how this event in these guys' lives ruined their lives in yeah, many, many cases. Um, doors were closed to them that would have maybe been otherwise open. Plus, you know, we hear the police struggling with trying to explain that they believe these guys were telling the truth, but they still had to investigate it like a homicide because Travis was missing, right? And because it was such a well-known story, if anybody who sees our documentary then goes and reads or learns about it in, in the history books, they'll realize it was a real event. And I think because we took the approach of, of a human interest story, I think, but like you were saying, when people finish watching the film, 
they have a sense that there is some closure. You know, the boys go back to the woods together. They're now in their 60s. They've forgiven each other. And they still had this incredible event together. And they're bound by, with each other for the rest of their lives because they all experienced this incredible thing. And they were just normal, everyday people like you yeah. and I. Yeah. You know, average people with this incredible experience. So I think that's why it did so well. You know, I just decided I was going to put it out there in film festivals. I was going to just enter in and as many as I thought would take it. And you know, as a filmmaker, you have to kind of go to a festival site, look and see what kind of genres they take. Do they even take documentaries? Mm -hmm. And then you got to kind of qualify it and enter it into their festival guidelines. And I put it in 50 film festivals and it got into 28 and won awards. Wow. So I was... I was shocked it did that well. I, I eventually got to the point where it wasn't worth doing that anymore because people don't take documentaries beyond like a two year limit. So I, yeah. I actually did two versions of a film. This was the 2015 version, the first version of the film. And what's recently come out just uh, a few weeks ago is the new version of the film. So this is the, it's actually the 2017 version that I then continue to improve. This is the one that I saw because I saw a rough cut of the, the yeah. new version. Yeah. yeah, you saw a rough cut of the new version. So what we did is we went back and we took the onboard the craft experiences and we augmented that. We, we did it in a CGI, um, you know, so there was like live filming with CGI built in around it to really explain what happened on board that craft that Travis remembers. And in fact, I can send you that link and you can share that with your viewers at, uh, below here when they're watching. Okay. Um, because then what we did is we took that CGI and then we even muted it a little bit more and made it a little more interesting, putting it back into the original version. And now what I've done is I've done a closed caption or what's called CRT or SRT files. Yep. So when you go to watch the film, whether you buy it as a DVD, which is available on the main website of the film, mm -hmm. or whether you go to Amazon, it's now up on Amazon, but we now have closed caption files. So if you're hearing impaired, you can read it in English. But if you speak other languages like uh, French, Portuguese, Spanish, or Japanese, you can see it in those. And I think I will soon be loading a Czech language up because it was done in, I think it was, no, Greek. It was done in, it, Peter had it translated for a conference he was at and uh, they did it in Greek. So I'll have that up shortly too, in Greek. Well, I went to the uh, to Amazon and I did not see that it was available. Maybe that was the well, old one. You know what? It, it is the old one. And, sh and, and I know that they've accepted it but I don't know exactly when they're going to post it. It should okay. be sometime before the end of April is what I'm told. But okay. yeah, right now when you go, it says uh, video is not available, but people should check back because it is streaming with the closed captions and the newer version, because what was up there before was the older version. Yeah. So we took down the older version and now they've accepted the newer version and they just have to, to get it Did up. Did you call it the director's cut? Um, I originally I did on this one. I think I just called it the 45th anniversary edition. So, it's yeah. Like, what is it? Close Encounters, the final edition, or the you know? There's all these. I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'll I'll tell you. Just this past year, I did a film with Peter Robbins about James Forrestal. So I did not, I haven't seen that. I, yeah, he's, yeah. I like Forrestal. Yeah, I, like well, I, will, I will send you this link and you can, you can watch it. It's called His Extraordinary Life and His Suspicious Death. So it's basically about uh, Forrestal's life, the positions he was in, what he most likely had to know. And um, there's a lot of evidence that he didn't, you know, jump out of that window uh, himself. At he, the was he was he pushed out. He was thrown out. out. We, we share some of those facts. I mean, we, but basically it's all in what's obviously out there already in historical facts. We don't make anything up. We just put the facts together for you yep. and let the audience decide. Well, and that's good investigative reporting. And, you know, and that is what Sitchin always considered himself is to be an, an investigative reporter because of his background as a journalist. That's right. And, you know, he was really into the history. And I know he was really into the... Um, uh, you know the 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 Israel becoming a nation. You know he fought. He did he did everything that he could possibly uh, do to make that come to uh, fruition. And then 
Then he left. I had never figured that one out. Well, I know why he did it because that was, that's where the Israel chamber of commerce uh, opened up a New York office. And he was, that was so the, the, the Zionist organization was funding that so that we could have trade between the U S and Israel. And uh, that was, that was all, uh, Mr. Sitchin's doings. He's a, he was quite a, quite a guy, wasn't he? He did some amazing things. You know, I had this aha moment after I had started to, to read Sitchin. I, uh, I had the chance to go to, to England often because my, at the, at earlier in our, my, my life and my husband's life, uh, my husband managed a company in London, outside of London in Reading. So we would go to England a lot and we would be in London and I would always go over to the British Museum because you could spend hours and hours and hours in there and never really fully, you know, let it all sink in. So I get off the tube stop and I'm walking towards the British Museum down the main street it's on and what do I walk by? But the London School of Economics where Zach went to school. <laughs> and I went, oh, of course, now I get it. Like Zach really didn't want to go and study economics, right? But he was there, and what was his distraction was almost across the street. Was the, it was the museum, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So when he was in college, this is when these ideas really started to, to kind of come together. I think he always had the festering. Like, he tells stories about being in a yeshiva when he was a little boy mm -hmm. in, in what was then Palestine, right, because his parents were Russian immigrants who had immigrated to Palestine. And he was in a yeshiva and was reading the translations because he was already somewhat of a linguist when he even started school because he spoke Russian and he had, was learning Hebrew, right? And he had just no Aramaic. If you're reading the Bible in Hebrew, you have to know, you know, um, uh, Aramaic and, uh, and Hebrew together. So, because he did the, Arabic as well, because I've heard him talk Arabic. about it. That's mm -hmm. right. The Bible is written in Aramaic and Hebrew and in some parts Arabic. So, Long story short, he uh, raised his hand one day in school and asked the teacher, you probably know this story, mm -hmm. why are you translating this particular word to mean, you know, uh, giant, you know, when actually it means something else, you know? It means, it, Nephilim doesn't mean giant, it means those that descend. I mean, the root word nephil means to go down or to descend. And, and the im at the end is the conjugation in Hebrew that means those that descended. So he said, why are you translating nephilim to mean giant? It doesn't mean giant. It means those that came down. And he thought that his teacher was going to say, good boy, Zach. You know, you're, <laughs> you know your language. You're very smart. And instead, the teacher said, sit down, shut up, and don't question authority. Right. And that was the beginning of the rest with Zach, right? He questioned right. authority the rest of his life. Well, he was right at those at that formative age where, you know, he felt like he had achieved something and, and he knew it and then he to be to be crushed, oh that 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 sets your path for the next eighty five right. years. That's right. <laughs> he didn't he didn't like to be uh, questioned or challenged. And in fact, his uh, his publisher, Jeannie came to his memorial service and talked about the fact that she would get the book, the transcript from Zach, and then she would have to go over them with her editors. And, you know, if there were corrections they had to make, they, she, they would make them. And they would have to come back to Zach with the corrections or the questions and say, did you mean this or did you mean this? And he would get furious with it. And he'd say, you can't change a single word. I use that word because that's the word I wanted in there. And it means specifically what I wanted to say. So he didn't like being challenged. Well, let's that's, talk why about he never did, that's why he never did debates either. He was like, I don't know what yeah. other people know. I only know what I know. Don't yeah. quote me other people's material. I'm not going to comment on it. You know? Oh, and I've got several videos with him doing that to the person interviewing. Oh, that's not mine. That's not mine. <laughs> you go ask them. They're the one that wrote that. I didn't write that. Um, let's, uh, I want to talk uh, a little bit because you were very, and I'm going to, be doing a slideshow here so some pictures uh, kind of interspersed with our with our interview but um there are a lot of pictures with you and his wife rena and mm -hmm. there's a great picture of you sitting right in between them which yeah, i think was, was classic yeah. <laughs> yes. tell me about tell me about i, I know that 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 rena is the one who said hey quit talking about it and write it 
you know, and uh, he finally wrote his first book. But um, who was the boss? <laughs> <laughs> who had the most influence on the other and you know give me yeah, a, a, Rena, a Rena dynamic. certainly to a large extent Rena wore the pants in that family <laughs> she would tell Zach what to do and it's she is the one that's responsible for getting him to finally write because she one day she said oh, enough already you've been talking to me about this for 20 years stop telling me the rest of the world needs to hear this you know because he'd be defending his position to her and she'd say i get it don't tell me shut up and write you know sit down and write a book <laughs> and i don't know if you know this story but you know when zach was coming out with his very first book uh van D van donegan beat him van donegan's publisher beat him to the the press by a few weeks, I mean, Sitchin was ready to come out with his first book. I don't even remember what it was going to be called. And when Von Donegan's book came out, Sitchin pulled his book from the publisher and said, wait, he's basically said all the same things I was going to say. I need to say it better. And he rewrote the book and then gave it back to the publisher and it came out in 1976. But Chariots of the God came out in 1975. And at that point, I don't think Zachariah knew who Von Donegan was. They didn't know each other. But uh, Zach was always really mad about that. <laughs> like, yes, and there's an interesting, it. what's that? Yeah, and Zach was like, man, he just slipped his stuff in there, like faster than I could say Jiminy Cricket. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a buzzkill there. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I have this great video, and you, I think I sent it to you. It was the Lifetime Achievement Award from uh, uh, Coast to Coast. Uh, At the New Life Expo in California. George oh, like Norrie, he yeah. read the letter from Von Donegan, Von which to yeah. me kind of summed it all up. It was, it was beautiful. It was. Von Donegan never had a beef with Sitchin. It was only Sitchin with Von Donegan. Well, and, 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 you know, Chariots of the Gods in my, my last episode, I talk about that extensively because that was a huge influence in my life. And you know, that I, I was just looking and I can't remember the numbers exactly, but when Chariots of the Gods, the movie came out in 19, whenever, it made $24 million, which is today is something like $479 million it made at the box office. I mean, no one does a documentary and makes that kind of money except, you know, Michael Moore or someone. Right. So. Right. That was or the, 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 the Lion King or whatever that guy, Tiger King. <laughs> you know, and I, I think Von Donegan's letter, not only was it very sincere, but it was very, very true. Because yes. if Zach had come out with the depth of the 12th plan first, people wouldn't have known how to deal with it. They would have read it and it would have like, you know, would have gone over their heads. And, and actually, it was Zach's first book, and his later books, I think, got better. But he went into such depth about, you know, the Hittites and the Chaldeans and the, you know, the Chaldeans and all these people and, you know, this period of history that so people know any, anything about. They, you can very easily get lost or, or mired down in the details in the middle of the 12th planet. I mean, it starts out with a bang, and it ends with a bang. But the middle is all this meaty history that you think, whoa, why do I need to know all this? But it does become fundamental later on as you read more of Sitchin. Well, he was but, just so thorough. I mean, and he, he had was. to be. I, and I think that's, he's probably, and of course, I didn't know him. You did. But he's probably one of those uh, obsessive compulsive persons when he needs to, you know, when he's, when he's doing something. Is yeah. that right? Yes, that's right. That's right. And, you know, he... He likes to make sure that he's very, very clear when he presents, too. And he goes over and over his, uh, he used to go over and over his slides and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. And that's another great thing to talk about, about Sitchin. You know, he would show up at a lecture with his box of slides and you'd have to <laughs> rent a carousel, right? This was already in 2000, 2002, 2003, 2004. He'd show up for a lecture and you were like, what? We're using, you don't have a PowerPoint? What? We're using a carousel, a slide projector, you know? And then you'd have to make sure you got them all in the right way. Not only yes. they could be upside down or right side up, that was a problem, but then they could also be reversed front or back. And if you got them in backwards, 
the script, if he had any kind of script on them, if they were special made slides, well, then that was in reverse and you couldn't read it. So, oh my gosh, the hassle of putting those. <laughs> and then God forbid you dropped the box, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, then he had to go back over. You know, he didn't have them numbered. You know, he just knew what order they were in. But then you had to like look at a script and hold up the slide. And oh, was this the right one? Oh, oh it was God. a nightmare. It was he a talked nightmare. about. He talked about it, I think, uh, at one point, a bulb blew, and they were up till 2 o'clock trying to find a bulb. Oh, yep, yep, yeah. And like, then, some, some cases you had, he would then make you, if you were organizing the event, you had to have a second bulb for that projector. <laughs> you had to order one and have it on hand. Yeah. And then I well, think his feelings were hurt when he was told that, that the slide machine was passe, I yeah. think is what he oh, said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. In fact, when I would go to all these Sitchin seminars, and you were you were mentioning earlier this cute picture you have of me where I'm right between Z, you know, Zach and, and his wife, Rena, and I'm looking at the camera, but Rena's looking at me and she's like pinching my face, you know? So that was taken at one of those Sitchin seminars because we would all not only have a whole educational day, but then we would have a banquet that night. And then what Zach would do is he would get up to a podium and he would get up and he would talk about the, uh, the students in the room and the ones that had come to the former Sitchin seminars and how grateful he was that we returned to learn more. And eventually it got to be a really big crowd. Like he would invite you up and he'd give you this little thing. It was usually a picture of a cuneiform tablet and over it was written Zachariah Sitchin seminars you know, studies Chicago or California or Los Angeles and the date, and then he would sign it. So you got something with his signature on it. So that was one of those seminars where I had gone up to just get a picture with Zach and Rena. And I had handed my camera to someone and I was between them. And instead of Rena looking at the camera, she looked at me and pinched my face. So she, <laughs> I got, I was very lucky. Yeah. For some reason, you know, she liked me. And if you, if she didn't like you, you didn't get into the inner circle, you know, you weren't, you weren't welcome to come over and talk to them at their table or, you know, and I used to go to New York all the time with my husband to go see theater and we take our girls up. In fact, uh, one of my girls always say they, they, you know, by the time they were 12, they saw more live theater than they did television, which is probably <laughs> <laughs> but while we would go to New York for three or four days, usually on Sunday morning, I would tell Zach I was coming. I would call him up and I'd say, can I take you and Rena to breakfast? Can we just talk and visit? And he would say, sure, sure. That would be great. So sometimes it would be David Greenbaum and myself. Sometimes it would be Peter Robbins, you know, or other friends I had in New York. Uh, other girlfriends would meet me and they were all clamoring to, you know, come to breakfast with Zach. You know, it was like this right. big deal. So he would tell me where to meet him and Rena would come in. So that's where I really got to know Rena. And she really got to adore me in, in some ways. And um, we got to be family friends. In fact, one year um, I got to know his brother Omnin. And one year Omnin invited my whole family to Florida to join them for a Passover Seder. Because we were going to be in Florida and Zach was also going to do a Sitchin seminar down there. So in order for me to be down there, the seminar was on the weekend right after Passover and I, I couldn't do both. And I said, Zach, this is a problem. And he said, oh, no problem. We'll just have you come and join us for Passover. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, uh, wow, that's interesting. So that was very sweet. I was yeah. very, very touched to be invited. So, um, you know, I felt lucky that I got to, to know his family in that way. It was a, it was a real treat. You know, the Amnon just turned 90 uh, about two or three months ago. So wow. he's the age of Zachariah when he passed. And um, Amnon's in, um, he's in a retirement home down in, um, I forget where it is, Palm, Palm Beach, Florida, somewhere yeah, in that area. That might be yeah. Palm Beach Gardens area. Yeah. He lived in Boynton Beach for a while. So, mm. And that may be, I'm not sure where he is now, but yeah, the last time I talked to him, he was, he was there and he was just kind of, he was really into the uh, impeachment, so oh. that was taking up a lot of his time. <laughs> um, let's see. I wanted to. Um, you you told me uh, on the phone, well, several times. You know that Sitchin was kind of unapologetic, and um, you know he, he liked being right. He knew what he knew, but there was an incident in 
Italy that you talked about. You want to you want to tell us about that? Where yeah, where he yeah. ended up recanting maybe? Yeah, eventually he did. Um there was an event. I wasn't on this trip. I as I said, I never really got to travel to ancient sites with him, but I think they had been to see like the Shroud of Turin or something. I think they were like in Northern Italy and Milan. There's probably a busload of maybe 30, 35 of them. And they were traveling south uh, to a, a, a city further south. And along the way, there was someone else who had really admired Sitchin's work, who was a friend of one of the people traveling. And they had a large estate there and they wanted to invite the entire tour to come to their house for dinner. They agreed to like have an open, lovely catered dinner in their home for like 35 people. And Sitchin kind of uh, just said, oh, okay, we'll do that. And I don't think he really discussed it with Rena. And when they got on the bus and they're heading south, they, uh, you know, I think Zach explained what was gonna go on. And Rena was like, you're, you're, nobody changes your tour, Zach. No one's going to allow you to suddenly decide you're going to go somewhere else for dinner. We were just planning to go back to the hotel. And I think that's what she wanted to do. And she didn't want any part of this. And I think, she, as I said, I think she wore the pants in the family and she said, we're not doing that. And Zach kind of said, okay. And when it came time to pull off to go to this person's house, they just kept going straight and went to the hotel. And it was a, quite a shock to, of course, the tour people who were your the, his guests who were on the tour because they were all looking forward to going to this lovely, fabulous estate in Italy, this vineyard, I think it was, and have this catered dinner. And it wasn't like they had cell phones at this period of time. They couldn't call up the people and tell them, well, Zach changed his mind. And it got to be a big, you know, you know, problem. Uh, you know, I think people's feelings were hurt. But years later, actually, after Rena had passed away, Zach actually told a number of people who were on the trip that that was a mistake he made. And that was a big thing for Zach to do. He said, I shouldn't have done that. These people really bent over backwards to invite us to their house. And if for any reason, some group of the Italians who are watching this get to hear this, they'll know that Zach realized he'd made a terrible mistake. And, yeah. and he's, he's really very sorry about it. So yeah. there was a big heart there in Zach. You know, he was as much as he was afraid of being ripped off and he was afraid of people stealing his material or claiming it was theirs or, you know, he, he was still that little child in, in first grade at Yeshiva defending his, you know, his concept and his idea about the Nephilim most of his life. That, yeah. that little child stayed there. And uh, in fact, so much so, I think I told you the story, but you know, when we would go to these Sitchin seminars, he would say to us, I'm not going to be here forever. And it's up to you, you guys who are sitting here in the audience. You've got to get to know each other. You're going to carry on these Sitchin seminars. You're going to teach this work. You have to digest it, read it, understand it, and be the progenitors of this, of this information. So a lot of us in the audience took that to heart. And we kept thinking, okay, let's put together a PowerPoint like a Sitchin Seminars PowerPoint that we can get Zach to say, yeah, this is basically my work. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you guys got it. And this, if you're going to go out and teach my work, teach it from this. That's what we wanted. We wanted to codify some of his teachings into a PowerPoint DVD that we could be officially granted the permission to, you know, to do. So for one of the Philadelphia events that I put together, we plan to have him come up to a hotel room privately with you know six or seven of us that had worked on this PowerPoint. Bill Stanley put it together and I kind of worked on the ideas to it. And we said, Zach, we want you to come see this. So Zach came in the room and in, within five minutes, he saw what we were doing and he got up and left. He said, you haven't gotten my permission to do this. And we were like, <laughs> what? Like, well, we thought this is what you wanted us to do. And he was like, those are my images from my book. And we said, well, yeah, but we put right on it, you know, Z Sitchin, you know, yes, of course it's yours. We're giving you the credit. We're not stealing the you the credit. We're going to be your progenitors. We're going to be your teachers. He couldn't get over that hurdle. He just like, for him, that was like, you, you're you stealing my stuff. And I, You know, I, I, and I may have told you this and, and 
hopefully William Henry is going to be our guest uh, soon. Oh, but he's he, wonderful. He is, and but he told me the most wonderful story. You know, he had been a huge uh, fan of Sitchin for forever, and he had traveled with Sitchin, and um, you know, he he was part of that that group, and he kind of cut his teeth on that that whole thing, and you know, now he's the famous. Uh, well, he has like three, four shows on Gaia Network, uh, the Ascension uh, uh, shows, and a lot of different. And, and he's he's he absolutely knows everything about art, which I love watching his shows where he explains that. But he was telling me so when his first book came out, he he was he was so excited, you know, gets a copy and he decides he's going to send it to Zechariah Sitch and thanking him for what he he had done. And uh, so he gets it and, you know, he's like, you know, I, 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 I used your theories and, you know, I, you really inspired me. And, you know, I put a couple of your little drawings in here and, and yada, yada, yada. And he sent it off. And okay. yes, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know where this is going. So he, a few weeks later, he gets a, a letter from Zachariah Sitchin, you know, from New York. He opens it up and it's a bill for Two images, one hundred and twenty-five dollars a piece that he used. <laughs> well, that's good. Good for Zach. He gave him the right to buy the images. He figured he couldn't unpublish the book, right? He said, "I had to pay for somebody. I had to pay somebody for this. And this is what I paid them." Right. But I wonder if he paid the full amount. So, so William Henry may actually own those out right. outright now. So, right. But I just, you know, that was just a, f because it, it, it did to me, that was the story that that's the Sitchin that I yes. imagine. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that was that. He had to be in control of everything. There was a time when I was going to videotape one of his best lectures he ever did was in Philly at one of these uh, free library events that he did, which was open to the public. But all the Sitchin seminars who were there for a seminar at a hotel, we came over to see his lecture and I was going to film it. And I was going to do a two camera shoot. And one of the cameras had, I had to put it on a tripod so they would be stable. But one of the cameras loaded, it was an old tape camera. It was a high def camera, but the tape loaded from the bottom side of the, of the camera. So you had to take it off the tripod to load it. So what I did, and I, I didn't, I couldn't put in a long tape in it. It wouldn't take like an hour and a half tape. So I just, I was streaming it out to another little clamshell device I had with a, with a long tape in it. And uh, that's where I was recording. And he came in and he didn't like the setup. He didn't understand what I was doing. He thought I was making a copy of his lecture, which I wasn't. The tape that was in there wasn't on, but I needed to have a tape in the camera to get it to run. But I needed the long tape in the small little cam clamshell. Or actually, I, I, was, I was shooting it on 60 minute tape and I had to change the clamshell. And if it was in a, a freestanding clamshell, which is like a little video recorder, I could take the tape out and put it in and you'd never know. You know, it's not like I had to take the camera off the tripod. I tried to explain this to Zach forget it. He was like, take it all down. You're not videotaping. <laughs> like he met, he didn't understand, but he refused to let me tape it at that point because he didn't like the way my setup was. And I was, I was using my own equipment. I was like, well, Zach, you know, if you would have told me, I would have rented equipment if you were willing to pay for it, but I'm doing this for free. Right. So <laughs> I'm doing it with what I have and this is, it'll come out perfect. It'll be fine. You'll be thrilled. And he was like, Nope, you don't need you don't need two cameras and you don't need this third. And so that was it's, you know I've he, noticed he in some of the, he was yeah. a curmudgeon. That's the right <laughs> word for it. Should I rename the documentary? <laughs> <laughs> the curmudgeon. Yeah. I mean we loved him. We yeah. loved him. And you know, I went through this. I think I told you these stories too. I was a at that point I was making films, right? And I said to Zach, look, you have how many trips did you make? Seven, eight, ten fabulous trips around the world, you know, Syria and Egypt and Lebanon and, you know, Persia and Peru and I, all sorts of places. You know, I would love to edit these together for you. Let me look at your tapes and see what you have. Well, he, he said no for years and years and years because he, he didn't want to release them to anybody. And David Greenbaum was going to do some of this work for him too. But, you know, David was married, he had a young family, and 
you know, he was at a point in his life where he didn't have the time to do it. And I was at the point where I was more retiring and did have the time. And I offered time and time and time again. Finally, when I'm working on these, uh, when I'm working on this film, the Disclosure Dialogues, and trying to get that finished in around 2009 and 2010, he finally decides he's ready for me. I've got to, he calls me up one day and says, I want you to come to New York. I want you to rent an apartment. I want you to bring your editing software up and we'll start to work on this documentary. And I'm like, so I have to like rent an apartment like myself. I, you know, and, and he said, yeah, cause I'll come over there and work. You know, I couldn't come to his place to work. I had to work at my own place. And I was like, Zach, this is going to cost me like, you know, what five six thousand dollars a month just to rent the apartment let alone my living expenses and everything and how can i get a short-term rental you know, like airbnb didn't exist then you know mm -hmm. i was like i just don't quite think this is going to work plus i'm in the middle of this project and i am my mother would all, had also just passed away and i was dealing with her estate and i was just like i right now this is you know what I could have done it two years ago or three years ago. I, I just, I would have done it, whatever it cost. I just would have done it. But right, right then and there, I couldn't. And then of course he passed away and it's so frustrating. I, I also said to him, Zach, why can't I work for my house? Like, send me the tapes. I'll go through them. I'll see what you have. I'll see what's usable. I'll see what we can, what, you know, I don't know if it's in focus. I don't know if there's good sound. I have to see what you have and see if I can work with it and what format it's in. He wouldn't release those tapes, you know, and now they're, I think they're in the trash somewhere. I know. You know? If, if, if what I was told was true, he passed away. They went in, cleaned up the apartment, threw all the videotapes in the dumpster. Mm -hmm. And you said, how many did you, you, you guessed at how many there were? 60, 70, something like that, at least. Hour yeah. long. Yeah, at least. Yeah, he probably used 60 minute tapes. I mean, some tapes could be 30, but mostly it was all shot on mini DVD tape because Ted said that would be 720p, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it would have been yeah. really yeah. good footage. It would have been pretty good footage. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I know. Now we're going to have to animate him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going there. I'm the okay. voice cloning and the, uh, that's a, that's enough for my poor computer's about to choke. Jennifer, we have been talking for an hour and a half and this has been wonderful. Oh, and, um, I'm it's just so special for me. It really is. You know, I wanted to tell you if you would mm -hmm. like to share with uh, your viewing audience the memorial I did for Zach, I would be so honored uh, for you to share that. You Absolutely. Feel free to. You can post it, you know, put it on a link below there if you want. Um, Actually, I've already converted it to 4, 4K using oh, the uh, machine learning. So I'll put that version on there if you want. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, I, after Zach passed, I was sitting in my office here where you're seeing me now and I was thinking to myself, okay, I literally talked to him. I said, Zach, okay, I only have a few things I can use of you. I've got some interviews that a dear friend of mine, Jim Graypeck had done years before. He said I could use as part of the memorial. So I knew I had some nice stuff to work in, but I said, give me some guidance here, Zach. What do you want me to say about you? You know, what, where, where should I go? What should I look at at the tape? Because, you know, you have this hour-long lecture. You know, what, what do you look at? And literally I heard this tiny little voice in my head, you know, that said, go to the front of the tape and go to the back of the tape. And you'll get your beginning and your end. And that's what I did. And I found him being introduced in one lecture in, as, a, as Zachariah and what the name Zachariah meant. It meant to remember. And that's kind of what we all have to do. We kind of have to wake up and remember. And that's what his name means, Zachariah, it means to remember. And then at the end, you know, he talks about, well, I hope my life had meaning. I hope that what I did was worthwhile and that, you know, uh, I didn't waste my life, that I did something constructive. And that was like, wow, I think that's really what Zach would want us to think about him. You know, and so I was crying at the end of that. Like, like finally, when I, when I got it, when I saw the pieces he wanted me to incorporate, I went, wow, I wonder if he's really talking to me. You know, <laughs> maybe he did. Maybe I was able to hear him. You know, it was very poignant. And I know that um, I used that in my first uh, teaser at, at the end, you know, just kind of him 
you know, and he wasn't even, that was, that was years before, that was five, six years before he died. Uh, yeah, I think that was 2008. Maybe? Oh, okay. So a couple of years. 2008 yeah. and he died in 2011, I think. There's a wonderful video that, um, that I got from uh, actually Ron James and it, it's where Sitchin talks about um, the end of days, his books. And he said, but my end of days are nearing as well. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it's very, very, very beautiful. And, you know, you can tell an older person, they start reliving that even the hardest of hearts can, can, can melt sometimes. And, you know, you start questioning, was I doing the right thing? Is this what I was supposed to do? You know, yeah. we'll all do it. I thought I was going to be a rock star, but it's just, uh, you know, I'll be 85 going, should I have pursued the rock star thing? <laughs> I think you're going to be a rock star in your own right for the things you're doing, Eric. And I think you will really be honored and recognized for this film about Zachariah. And I'm so glad you're doing it. And I'm so pleased to be any part of it that I can to help in any way. It's really been an honor. Well, I, I, I really appreciate that coming from someone. Because after I saw, you know, you and I talked first on the phone many times. Then I saw your documentary and I was like, oh, man, I suck. Because she's like really good. Oh, uh, that's not true. <laughs> That's not true. Yeah, you're, you're a compliment. You know, you, did, you, 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 Travis was a beautiful portrait of a of a person and a group of people who were just minding their own business, and something extraordinary happened. And I, I, I hope everybody sees this because, again, it's not sci-fi stuff. It's not craziness. It's just a bunch of lumberjacks going. I know what I saw, you know, <laughs> and it's beautiful. And I, I do congratulate you on that. And, um, um, but I'd like to get one of those EBs cause you don't need three of them. <laughs> I have four. Oh, you've got well, four. Yeah, <laughs> listen, you, you finished the, uh, the Travis, uh, you, you finished the Sitchin video and we'll get it in the international UFO Congress and you'll get, you'll, you'll get two right away. I bet right off the bat. Mm -hmm. And hopefully I'll be there with you to, to uh, revel in the celebrations when this whole coronavirus is gone. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Well, I want to talk to you soon and um, I will see you next time. I can't wait. And if you record it and put it up online somewhere, send me the link. Wasn't that fun? Jennifer's a, she's an amazing person and I am very, very, very happy to have her on our team for the Sitchin Chronicles documentary. Well, that's our show for this week. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be announcing the uh, special guest uh, for next week. And um, it's been kind of crazy around here. We're in the process, right in the middle of a pandemic, of moving uh, across country from Indianapolis to Los Angeles. So um, hopefully nothing will come up. Uh, I'll have some sort of presentation no matter what next week. But, uh, you know, if our house sells... We're going to be packing boxes, so, but I'll figure out something. I might do it live. Who knows? Until next week, remember, no matter where you go, the Anunnaki were there first. Take care. <laughs>